Frank. Yes. Broadcast is live. Is, what do you guys have? Something fun? Do, is there a way for us to tell how many people are watching? I don't know. Uh, from all of the different streams, probably not. Thanks, Alexi. Um, <clears throat> ah, cool. She'll keep us informed. Wait, so Chase, describe how exactly you had to swab yourself. Oh, well, <laughs> you want details? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will. One of the uh, local casinos, since I'm visiting in Vegas right now, is uh, closed down the Fiesta. So they turned it into uh, a COVID um, testing center. And it's just like military and police there that guide you through everything. They're like doing it in the parking lot. It's really strange. Uh, <laughs> And you that finally you get yeah you get registered and you pull up to your station and I'm guessing medical volunteers come over and they just kind of hand you the kit and then they describe what you're supposed to do with it like yeah see this and there's like a little marker on the swab you have to like stick it that far up your nose and Jeez. get it at least three turns and then you have to do it on the other side and get at least three turns and it's it's slightly uncomfortable I don't know how you do it to yourself. <laughs> Yeah, it made my eyes tear pretty bad. <laughs> I'm like, sorry to make you cry. <laughs> Are you feeling better than this morning? Uh, yeah, I'm feeling much better now. I'm just groggy and tired. I don't know what it is exactly yet, but wanted to get tested uh, to make sure it seemed, especially with like the fever, shortness of breath, all that felt yeah. very similar to the flu, but I feel like it's probably a little early for the flu in this area, so. Yeah. We, we have our thoughts on what it is, but we're going to hope that you continue to feel, start feeling better. And then Thank have you. Mild how many, whatever virus is going on. <laughs> how many days does it take for you to get the results back? <clears throat> uh, five. Three to five, yeah. That's what they said. Although I just read, because reading up some more the past two days, obviously, since it's on my mind. Um, I think in the UK, they have a point of care test that they just do in-house now mm -hmm. that's so it's like same day doesn't need to be sent out that's pretty cool there's some here like it depends on your testing center so some can give you the results in like 15 minutes oh, and then wow. some are taking like two to three days there is one like lab core does some where you can send it um they send it to your house and then you can take it like they send it like same day next day and they send it back to you within two days but I guess now everybody's getting the test. So even like those turnaround times are lengthening besides if you get like the 15 minute rapid. Gotcha. Huh. Interesting. Oh, I just noticed that when you mute it on our end, the mute button seems to show up next to your name. I wonder if it's recording that way. Oh, because I'm going to have to like clear my throat a lot during this. So <laughs> fun time. <laughs> it is. All right. Uh, <laughs> so what? Who cares? Yeah, yeah. Who cares? Live. Well, it looks like it's it's about starting time. Don't we? Okay. All right. We go. Wait a few minutes, or I don't know. Should we start going? Let's see what. Okay. Let's go. Here we go. All right. Going. All right. Um, well, thanks everybody to for coming today to our first behind the mic live. Um, I'm Sam Smith. I created MCAT Basics, which is behind me up on the wall. Um, I also host it, and I'm here today with a few of my fellow co-hosts from the Med, Med School Coach podcast. I'll let you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves. With uh, Let's go, er Erkita, go first. All right. I was adjusting my little light, but my name's Erkita DeRowan. I'm a very new host of The Perspective Doctor, so it's very interesting to be here tonight and to hopefully hear some questions from you guys. And I'm Chase DeMarco, host of the Medical Anemonist podcast and the One Minute Preceptor podcast. Uh, joined up with Med School Coach for sort of a podcast uh, team up here earlier this year. And uh, hopefully we can answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. Um, so, Chase, I'm going to start with you here. I'm actually going to ask a question here first. Uh, to talk about how you got into podcasting. So you have obviously have two podcasts. Um, they're both a little bit different, but I, I'm just curious myself. I haven't this story. How, how did you get into podcasting? Oh, sure. Um, I started off when I met some of the guys from Inside the Boards, another very popular medical podcast. And 
I was having a lot of difficulty with my studying and I just kind of had plateaued for a long period of time. And no matter how much I did, I wasn't how much time I put into my studies. I wasn't really advancing at all. And just so happened I was walking through the library after a study session, I often go and get uh, a study room at the public library for some quiet time. And browsing through some of the aisles as I was walking out of there, I came across a book on speed reading for dummies. And I thought speed reading was complete BS. And uh, is it it's, not? It's so there's a lot of BS teachers out there, no, but I it's can't. not BS. Um, but that kind of led me down this pathway where I started learning about speed reading, trying to implement that a little bit because I'm a terrible reader. Uh, I have dyslexia, have issues where, you know, reading comprehension is not my strongest skill. I kind of have to turn everything into a visual image in my head. And then that led me into visual mnemonics, which a lot of the students might know through sketchy medicine and pigmonic and stuff like that. And I just wanted to learn more, but there are a lot of resources out there that'll charge you a couple hundred dollars an hour or for their course or for their tutoring. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to start a podcast and invite them on. And so I don't need to spend that much money. And that kind of started off the whole progress of the medical nemesis podcast and then started getting cognitive psychologists on explaining what we know about learning from the cognitive psychology, educational psychology perspective, and really just tackling anything that has to do with learning more efficiently. And then I don't know if I should go into the other story right now or if we should move on. <laughs> no, go into the other story. Wait. Okay. Yeah. Why not? Go into the other story. All right. Uh, the other one actually really started after I had, I was towards the end of my clinical rotations and thinking about all of my clinical experiences for third and fourth year, the obstacles that myself and other classmates had come across, especially as IMGs, we don't have the same resources as a lot of American graduates will. And I thought one way to What's maybe IMG. Make sure everyone knows what IMG uh, is. Yeah. International medical graduate. Yeah. International. Uh, also sometimes called FMG for foreign medical graduate. There's a lot of debates on which one should be used in which occasion. Uh, for instance, a lot of students will use IMG for those that go to a Caribbean school, because that's mostly US and Canadian students anyway that go to those schools versus a school in, you know, like another continent elsewhere. That's more likely to be called an FMG. So yeah, there's a lot of weird terminology there. Um, no clear distinction at this point that's agreed upon, I don't think. But that being said, there were a lot of interesting rotations, we'll say, and uh, a lot of limitations. And I thought a great way to um, expand out the available sites for other students in the future is going to be bringing on more physicians, for instance, more clinical sites outside of the usual university hospital setting that um, American graduates are more likely to go through. And I wanted to prepare students for those types of rotations. So I bring in a lot of, um, well, all ranges, but private practice, direct primary care, community hospital, university hospital, any preceptor from any environment is welcome to come on, explain to the students what to expect, how to best prepare for it, how to communicate with the medical team, how to ask for letters of recommendation, all of those questions that I saw asked a lot in my <clears throat> third and fourth year, we kind of tackle those there. And I'm running out of breath here with Corona. <laughs> <laughs> you're good, man. You're good. Rikita, I'll, I'll pass this off to you now. Um, what, you know, kind of what got you into podcasting? I know that you were interested in student mentorship, um, some of those things during medical school, but maybe just talk about kind of why, why you wanted to get into podcasting. Yes. So as we give Chase a breath um, and a sip, <laughs> my Wait, we shouldn't let everybody know. I don't know if everyone here was here for this. Chase may or may not have coronavirus. Um, he got tested. Um, we're waiting. We'll know in three days. Um, anyways, Erkita, go ahead. Yes. Um, so I um, have a background in family medicine. I've always loved that. Um, going through my medical school journey, I um, went through a different process. I did a early medical school selection program where I did the, the summer after my junior and um, sophomore year of college and my entire senior year at a med school and took some courses and things and then matriculated through. But it was interesting in the process that there were 
15 students per year chosen to do that from historically black colleges and universities. And we were sent to Boston University. And it was kind of like real world. I don't know if that's still out on like MTV, like 15 strangers picked to live together in a house. And we literally lived together in a house for two years together in a brownstone. So like, those are some of my years now. Yeah, we, we had some stories, but through that each summer, like the seniors, the older class would live in the house with you. So there's only like 30 strangers living together. So with two brown wow. students that were connected. So they, they took on a lot of mentorship and stuff from the upperclassmen. And I continued to do that like with my other classmen. So when I got to medical school, we had this great developed bond with EMSSP, but then I also- What is that? Sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. That was, that's the short <laughs> medical of the medical, early medical school selection program that okay. I was talking about. Gotcha. So when I got to medical school, there were a lot of other students. Like we were all going through the med school journey and there were struggles and ups and downs. And we just wanted to encourage one another and then build on that to teach like the class below us. So I started doing mentorship through that. And I got really involved in the Student National Medical Association, SNMA. And from there, there are students who are involved in like service and, and medical school education and things like that throughout the nation. So I ended up going through the ranks of that and ended up doing serving nationally on their executive board and um, started like mentoring different students who like, they're like, oh, I'm interested in family medicine and connecting and stuff like that. So continued to do that during residency. We had a friend and I ended up starting like a medical student, like a pre-med mentorship stu uh, study place at Morgan University in Maryland. Um, and just trying to figure out how to like let people not necessarily fall into the same traps that you fall into in school. So I would mentor here and there. Even now, I still go back to BU once a year to talk to students. And I kind of just keep it at, kept it at that. Like, okay, when I need help or if, if someone wants like a preceptor or mentorship, I reach out. So use it as kind of like a side hobby. And then one day I was on Facebook and, and now we're living in 2020 where we're kind of in the house a little more. So a lot more. <laughs> yeah, a lot more for me because I, I love like traveling and going out and about. But yeah. I was on Facebook and I saw Chase had posted in a particular group about like, is anybody interested in like podcasting? And I was like, I don't know, maybe let me learn more. So I messaged him and we started talking and it seemed like I had never even heard of the perspective doctor, to be honest, but I started listening to some of the past episodes and it seems so refreshing to have this free resource available for students that I definitely didn't have when I was in school. And I'm actually really excited to be a part of it now. Good. I'm glad um, to have you on board. And yeah, thanks, Chris, for the shout out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll share my story last. So when I was studying for the MCAT, I was also working in a research lab. And um, on top of that, I was like kind of biking back and forth. You know, I was working every day, biking back and forth. And I was doing just such repetitive, like pipetting, you know, in your lab, you're just pipetting back and forth, back and forth. Um, at least in my position it was. And I wanted like a podcast, something I could listen to and there were some out there, but in my opinion, I just didn't think they were that great. And then, so when I was done um, studying and I took the MCAT, I like started kind of writing up listens. And then you, if you've listened to the very first, like two or three episodes of MCAT basics, it sounds really echoey. And that's because I was recording them in my garage at the time. And, you know, knowing nothing about sound, you're thinking, okay, here's a big empty room. This has got to sound perfect for recording. Um, little do you know, actually, like the closet is one of the best places to record. Um, so anyways, I, I started that and I've been enjoying it since, and it, it's a lot of fun to research these different topics, come up with lessons and, and then record them. Um, okay, Chase, here's, here's something for you that I was thinking about. So my, you know, my podcast is very narrator, right? I, I'm talking, it's just me, um, uh, you're doing interviews. So when you're recruiting guests, like how, how do you get guests? Like, okay, pretend that I am Anthony P. You know, I'm, I'm, how tall is he? Five, four. I'm a handsome devil. How do you recruit? <laughs> <me>? <laughs> um, well, I would say it's a little different for each show because there's a, a different target there for the medical anemonist. It is more 
memory champions, uh, memory trainers, and sort of cognitive psychologists and, and educators that really understand how we learn. Uh, for the one minute preceptor, it's preceptors, which means you're going to be usually currently or recently, or at least have a lot of past experience in clinical medicine, clinical education. What's a preceptor, uh, by the way? I'm not sure preceptor is a, yeah, it's a, it's a physician teacher or a clinician teacher. Preceptor can be for any clinician, I suppose, whether it be for doctoral students, for nursing students, for physician assistant. Um, it's, as far as I know, it's used universally for anyone that's teaching in the clinical setting. So gotcha. with, <clears throat> with that, uh, the physicians are generally much more difficult to organize with, um, especially since uh, when I started this off, I was just kind of cold reach, trying to find doctors and asking if they might want to come on the show. And that's not very effective. Physicians are very busy. Uh, a lot of them don't want to be in any kind of social media or podcasting or anything like that. But then once I found a few Facebook groups that are specifically for physicians in podcasting and physicians on social media, those types of groups, it's been much easier to find people already in that realm, already interested in the topic. And there's just a, a huge increase in opportunity there. If I was to cold call someone that's really popular, like Fauci, that would be quite difficult, I'm sure, because he's he's definitely a wanted man right now. Um right. What's the percent that you could get him? Uh, I suppose it depends on the method of outreach. For instance, if I was just going to cold email him, there's a good chance he won't ever see that. Some assistant's going to see it. How influential is that email going to be? How can I put my show in the best spotlight so that he'll say, yeah, that's actually going to be a great outreach. And if I had, you know, 50 to 80% of the student population listening to my show every week, then I'm sure I could get them. That's not the case. We don't have 50 to 80% of the student population that listen to podcasts. Um, yeah. right. <laughs> that would right. be, it'd be very difficult. Although it is nice that we have this network going on where we can cross promote too. So just because it's on one show in particular, doesn't mean that the audience and other shows won't necessarily hear about it. Um, but yeah, if it was on, let's say, Facebook or Twitter or something like that depends on what your past interactions have been with them. LinkedIn, a lot of it has to do with how your profile set up, but also how many shared connections you have. So it really does depend on the outreach. And often it takes more than just one pathway. You'll have to try a couple of different ways to see which one that individual is more, most likely to check. Gotcha. Makes sense. What about you, Akita? Any tips for recruiting? Yes, like how do you how do you line up your guests? Mike, I know I just listened to who was it? Michael Harrell. Am I saying that right? Dr. Michael Harrell, Harrell, Michael mm -hmm. Harrell um, who's an ophthalmologist. That I mean, he was a, he was a great guest. He was very just professional, and I, I learned a lot of stuff. So you know, how do you get guests like that? Well, first you start with your personal network. So Michael was in the program EMSSP with me. He huh? was actually about two years under me. So I, I started with practicing mentoring him. Um, and now he's big, bad op ophthalmologist. <laughs> but uh, of course, figuring out like people, you know, with different interests that would talk. But aside from that, I agree with Chase, I've been doing a lot of networking on LinkedIn, um, and finding people with interest that relate to prospective students or current medical students, or or listening to different podcasts with different interests and reaching out to them and just taking a shot and having that that quick brief summary of your show and what it is and the kind of yeah. impact they can do to pass forward their information. Gotcha. Oh, that makes sense. Chase, who's your favorite guest you've ever had? Oh, um, you, know, you can't pick a favorite. There's been so many good and inspiring guests on each show. Um, let's see. I don't know if, if we were to pick per show, like maybe a favorite topic might be more interesting. Um, on the medical anemonist, we're up to, I, I've lost I go 60 something episodes at this point, I think. I'm not, not sure. 70, 71. 70? Okay. So I've lost track since we have our new production team in place. I don't have to name, number it myself. I just send them the audio files. So. Uh -huh. 
like remembering the days of the week when you're not going somewhere every day. Um, <laughs> like during coronavirus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no one knows the days. During, during the coronavirus pandemic, it was like, you asked me whether it's a Tuesday or a Thursday or a Saturday, I would have no idea. They're, they're just, all the same. Yeah, they're all the same, which is horrible, but mm-hmm. it is what it is. It's like Groundhog Day. <laughs> yeah. Every day is exactly the same. Now, it's a little better now. I don't know. Yeah. Just you're in you're in Vegas right now? Yeah. I've, and they're open, right? Somewhat. Um, they've been opening up a lot more the past week or two. Um, mm-hmm. I haven't been keeping track of a lot of it because I don't generally go out to those places often, but uh, I hear a lot about it, I guess. Yeah. But I've been sure. traveling, uh, well, not as much recently, obviously, but since the start of the podcast, recorded podcasts in five different states. <laughs> Jeez. Wait, so what was your path exactly? How are you doing that on the mobile? Uh, well, it's How just a have... plan. So uh, the past two years, um, almost two years now, because I started the first one January of 2019, and I move around a lot as is, but I also have friends that I grew up with that are all in different states now. So sometimes when I'm just, you know, making the rounds, going to see them. I happen to have something scheduled during that time from weeks before, months before, and I don't want to cancel on that guest. So I'll just try to set it up to record wherever I'm at and hope for the best. Gotcha. Anyway, so sorry, I interrupted. You were talking about your favorite topic. Um, yeah. So, all right. Some of the more interesting ones that really stand out in my mind for the medical nemonist is... Uh, one we just did a reboot on, which was originally episode seven with Dr. Megan Samaraki. And she and her team have a great podcast as well called the Learning Scientist Podcast. They are cognitive psychologists that specifically study learning. So pretty much, you know, the information that is coming from them regarding space repetition, regarding uh, interleaving, regarding any other kind of evidence-based study technique that I tried to meld in to my show for and specifically the medical students is really evidence-based that it's really um, modern and backed by the science. So that's a great one. Um, As far as some of the memory ones, there's been so many great guests that have come on. We've had great memory champions come on. They've won multiple championships. One of them also is a medical student. So that's why it was one of my first uh, interviews was with Alex Mullen from Mullen Memory and Kathy Chen, his wife. They have a unique perspective of him being a memory champion, but also them both completing medical school. So it's really interesting to get their perspective there. Uh, one of the probably lesser known because he's not great at social media or advertising, but he's also worked with or taught a lot of the other people that are more well known in medical or in mnemonics training is Lev Golden Touch. And I think his episodes were in the 30s, I want to say maybe like 33 and 35. And one of them's named how to memorize a million items. And he kind of takes all of the high yield or all of the tools that I've discussed in other episodes, puts them all together and uses them in a very unique way, at least in a way that's unique to me. I've never heard it put together in such a complex way. So it's like mastery level. Like if you want a PhD in learning mnemonics, he would probably be the one He'd to the one. discuss it. Yeah. Interesting. Huh? The whole medical, the whole uh, memory champion thing is crazy. Rakita, do you know what a memory champion is? No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I didn't either, but <laughs> I, memory and they are winning. Yeah, exactly. That's about as far as my knowledge base goes. But that's so it's is it like memorizing the digits of pi? Like they'll do a competition to see how many digits you can memorize. Yeah, there's a there's a world memory champion. There's also um, local like by uh, country. So there's a United States memory champion. Um, Nelson Dellis won it several times and he was an early guest. Uh, Alex Mullen, I think, won world championships. A few other guests mm-hmm. have won multiple championships and basically some of the things they do and they try to shake it up. Um, and apparently this is why nobody knows about it because it's incredibly boring to watch because everything's going on in their head, but they have, you know, memorizing six decks of cards in like four minutes or memorizing pi to actually, I'm going to see memorize pi to like just the fact that 
you know, how many digits? I, I don't even know how that how that works. Like they have that on a piece of paper. What paper? How do you fit that on a piece of it's paper? It's all in your head. So, all right, that's outdated. The first one that popped up was from 2005, and someone memorized to the 67,000, almost 68,000 digits of pi, and that's been blown out of the water uh, multiple times. So they use a lot of the same techniques that we tried to implement for memorizing medical stuff. It's just, it's the same tool used in a different way. It's converting the information into, for them, a preset visual. So they have a visual for every digit, and then they can make a story with all of these visuals. And it's much easier to remember that story than it is to remember the arbitrary digits and what order they go in. But if you know that, you know, a swan is your digit for number two and a bat is your digit for number three, and then the swan's eating the bat or something, then you know the two comes before the three when you're rem when you're reciting the story to yourself later on. So you're doing a little bit of transcribing and some people are a little faster at that. Probably be a lot faster if we started that when we were younger than trying to learn as adults. But sure. uh, I'm definitely gonna teach my future kids that uh, so they can memorize uh, a million digits or a million items like Dr. Lev Golden Touch talks about. That's, That's crazy. Cool. What a name, by the way, Lev Gold Touch. Golden um, Touch. Golden Touch. Wow, even better. Okay, so there's a question here from Cheris. Am I saying that right? Cheris Courtney? Caris is how Caris. Caris. Okay, yeah, that's probably right. Courtney. Sorry, um, sorry ahead of time. We're terrible at pronouncing names. Yeah, no, I'm me especially. Um, so the question is, are there any particular topics? Oh, popped up there. Topics or aspects of the journey to becoming a physician that you would, that you feel could use more representation in podcasts? And how do you recommend starting a podcast from scratch? Hmm. Let's answer that first one. Particular topics. I don't know. Anybody? Akita? I've been thinking about that a lot since I'm, I guess, the new one here. Oh, is it Carice? Carice. 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 Okay. I, I think it's Paris. Paris. I have a, a different name as well, so I try to say things correctly. So, sorry, Karis. But um, I've been thinking about that a lot since I've started and trying to figure out what topics we like to have on the perspective doctor because, of course, we want things about admissions and how it is to go in the day to day of succeeding in the clinical rotations as well as in the first formative years where there's more uh, educational based written stuff. But I've been thinking of other what I like to call hot topics in medicine. So I think there are so many things we can cover, like the world is our oyster, like we we can talk about COVID, <laughs> we can talk about Someone wrote racial bias training. I love that. Recently, I interviewed someone who was talking about how we can be more um, advocate for things that are we believe in that are going on. I talked to someone recently about climate change. I talked to someone recently about like um, health equity and stuff like that. So I think that whatever you guys suggest, we'd love to hear it so that we can give you what you need and we can go and search and find those those discuss people who are experts in that topic. Um, so feel free to, to write what you think and we'll hear. I'm curious to hear what Chase and Sam have to say. I wasn't even looking at the YouTube comments here. I was stuck over on start. Sorry, we're switching back and forth between <laughs> different screens here. So I wasn't seeing the comments pop up here. Yeah, there's some good topics here and uh, some questions asked. Am I a doc uh, post? How do you describe it? I'm like in a transition year, uh, past all of my clinical rotations, courses, et cetera. Uh, I was planning on taking step two about a month ago. And after COVID and everything happened, it got pushed back. And now I'm um, doing some fighting with accommodations for my normal testing accommodations. Anyway, back to the question. Uh, the the different topics that we discuss in the shows are quite variable and i think they can all be of benefit we do discuss a lot of things regarding finance regarding leadership regarding transitioning from med or from pre-med to med school and from med school into your clinical rotations and then eventually from clinical rotations into residency training so between all four of our podcasts there's just a lot of material out there. If you have a specific topic you'd like to see covered that we haven't, then 
definitely let us know and we'd be happy to try to find the right person to speak to and the right show to put it on. Um, the racial bias training, I like that. Uh, I think this week, if it hasn't come out yet, I uh, just, the, okay, the learning, <laughs> oh, what was the title? Uh, what med school didn't teach you about racism. So it's one that I'm a little nervous about getting out there because it's such a controversial topic, or at least a hot topic, I'd say less than controversial. But it's something that we probably fear discussing more than we should, but we need to be open about these topics, like Urquita mentioned with climate change too. These are just parts of our society, the parts of science, and we shouldn't be afraid as scientists, as doctors, as whatever to discuss them. Otherwise, the politicians and the news pundits are the only ones you hear talk about them, and they're pretty much never correct on them. So we need to just be more outgoing with some of those. I agree, yeah. and I'm gonna do a shameless plug for those that are listening. Um, MIT is hosting a Hack Racism in Healthcare um, Summit on Sunday, and I'm gonna be one of the speakers and discuss some of the social determinants of health, and the engineers and some students are coming together and they are um, going to think of solutions that they can use technology to kind of hack some of the social determinants. So. It's free. If you look up MIT Hack Racism, there's a website I can probably say later. If you guys are interested, I'll look it up for you guys. But you can register and it's on Sunday. That's cool. awesome. I have to check that out myself. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I'll answer the second part of that question, which is how would you recommend someone starting a podcast from scratch? Yeah. I would just say it's got to be about something that you are passionate about or, or like doing, right? You, you know, you, you don't want to be stuck doing interviews on, I don't know, cats or something like that. Just something that's a little more, something that you really enjoy. So, you know, I love being able to write out, you know, a detailed lesson plan and then record these MCAT Basics podcasts. If I didn't like doing it, it would feel like a chore. Um, I think Chase and Arkita can probably also speak to this. But if you find something you're passionate about and also something where, you know, there's people that want to listen and, and want to learn about that topic. I think that's how you start a podcast from scratch and, and, and grow a podcast. Yeah, I want to say that about at least pre-COVID, I think like 90 to 95 percent of podcasts make it to a maximum of 12 or 14 episodes, which is good if you're doing a weekly release. That's, you know, about three, three and a half, four months worth of material. But then you kind of hit a wall because you didn't through long enough or you jumped into it too soon. I almost did that with the medical anemonist. I had a lot of interest in the topic, but I didn't think about all of the variations that I could discuss earlier on. I didn't sit down and make a long list of potential guests and a long list of potential uh, topics. And when I started running low of people that I had thought about interviewing, I'm like, shoot, what do I do now? I have a release in five days and I haven't interviewed anyone yet. And you get really stressed out at that point. So that's a, another aspect is just pre-plan as most as good as you can. Uh, I do recommend recording a couple episodes ahead of time before you start releasing just so you don't have, so you have a little backlog and don't get stressed out on the week to week. Um, but if you find that you can just jot down a bunch of items and topics and potential guests, whatever type of show you have, uh, way beforehand, kind of brainstorm it out. That'll make it much less stressful in the long term as well. Agreed. Agreed. Um, here's a question for both of you. Is there any more? No, okay. Here's a question for both of you. I'm actually interested in this. Have you ever had an interview go poorly or where you just felt like it was a, a horrible interview? So tell us about the experience. I'll let Arkita go first. Chase has a good one. Interviews, <laughs> but um, yes, I did. Um, and I think it was a combination of variables. Like Sam mentioned earlier, how when you're just starting out and you figure out which room you want to be in, so there there can be mic issues, and we've been dealing with my mic issue for a few weeks and trying to figure out the best mechanism and where I should. Uh, host from. So right now I'm in my office and it's kind of small, um, but the chair is more comfortable and stuff like that. So we have tried and I'll show you guys, I'll give you a sneak peek. I'm going to turn my computer. 
but this huge nice. mic cover, shield, whatever it's called, is making my sound better. So in a couple of my episodes, it's very echoey. So we, we had to fix that and edit it out. But I also had a guest who um, I, pre I know pretty well, so it was cool, but I think they didn't really understand uh, what type of questions I was gonna ask. So they asked for me to re-record the questions, um, their podcast. So I did, and the, the second time it went through, they, it's very good. I love the way that it came out with the interview. But one tip, maybe if you're interested in podcasting and interviewing people, is to send them some questions so they'll have an idea. So of course, it may be a conversation, but they can kind of have an outline of what to expect that you'll be asking them. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Always help to prepare the guest as much as possible beforehand. Otherwise, you run into a lot of strange circumstances that just take up a lot of your time. They can definitely eat away at your time and patience. <laughs> oh, boy. Should I? All right, so, up, man. I I'm sure that none of my past guests are going to be listening to this, so that's good. I'm definitely not going to identify them. But there's a couple of instances I've had in the past, uh, and this is on both shows, too, so I'm not going to specify which one, where guests either were extremely picky about their own audio, which to some degree makes sense because they want to share it with their audience as well if they have one, but to the point that it sounded fine to my ear and they basically forced me to re-record the entire episode. Like, I don't want you to, re to release that last one. Let's just redo the whole thing. Uh, the second one, in my opinion, didn't come out any better than the first one, but I was definitely not going to tell them that while we were recording it. So, like, all right, it's it's out. It's good. Um, so that was just kind of stressful because it's like you're losing control of your own show at that point. I did enjoy the material that was covered, so I appreciate the guest for that. Uh, it was just one of those things I didn't really plan for, and it kind of became a little stressful. Um, the other one, you'll hear this from a lot of other podcasters, too, is when your guest doesn't necessarily pick the best place to record and one in particular was not one of the more interesting conversations to begin with and then you have dogs running by and barking all the time you hear the nail scratching on tile or hardwood uh whoever's in the background is slamming doors like every five seconds for 15 minutes straight uh, to the point i had to just pause it and say hey um do you have another room we could go into or whoever's there can you maybe ask them to to go upstairs for a minute because i can't keep recording it the way we're currently recording it so but you feel kind of bad right because you're like this yeah. person's gonna be my podcast and exactly. they're taking time out of the day to talk to me so it feels kind of weird saying hey this sounds like absolutely but you also got to think that the audience is more important than the guest and if they're not going to listen to it because it's extremely you know noisy or annoying or there's a lot of just weird background stuff going on then you have to do it for the audience mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense um a question is and and we're not necessarily experts on this but what are your thoughts on a special master's program for pre-med students um and i in my opinion this is a better question for like a, an advisor and not to shout out med school coach but for an advisor there. I mean, that's what they talk about. But, you know, if your GPA is low, I think, and you're trying to get into medical school, a master's program is good if it boosts your GPA. Another thing is a lot of master's program, programs have research. Medical schools like research. Um, that's all about, all, about all I have to say about that, though. What do you guys think? I agree. I think there are different journeys for everyone. So if you, is, if you, went through traditionally and your grade, your GPA wasn't the best, it may be a good idea to take some of those courses as prerequisites to kind of showcase that you can handle the material. Um, some of it helps you with preparing for the MCAT. Um, and some sometimes people are non-traditional and they have to go through the process of getting the extra courses and things like that. I know quite a few people who've gone through certain master's programs and have ended up going into medical school from there. So they can be successful. I would just research the program and then look at the rate of students who actually do matriculate into medical school and then compare like what kinds of coursework you'll do. Um, and maybe that might be an idea for a topic that one of us can do on one of our shows about 
um, interviewing someone who has advice on either like one of the instructors from one of the master's programs or someone who's gone through the program to give you more information. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I don't think I have too much to add to that because the, there are a lot of complexities. It depends on what school you're trying to go to or schools. Are you good enough to apply now and you're just maybe putting off time? You do want to take that into consideration if you're just procrastinating, which I have seen students do in medicine and law. They'll wait. They're completely, you know, they're valid students right now to try to apply for whatever program they want. Uh, it's going to be high risk no matter what you do. I don't know that the master's is necessarily going to add a whole lot to your resume, to your CV, unless you just have some really big gaps there that you need to fill. But do consider that you're putting a lot of extra money into it potentially. And is it really worth that in the long run? Because all of those student loans, they're going to keep you know, gaining interest and just end up being a lot more effort that you have to pay back later if it's only adding a smidge of assistance to your complete uh, application. I agree with that. Those loans are real. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> you guys have any other, you guys have any questions for other hosts? Either of you? Hmm. I have one if you guys know. Yeah, go for it. Here's one, Chase. This is for you. Um, and sorry, Arkita, all of my questions right now are directed at Chase. If you have that case, like, that'll make you feel better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All the giggle. <laughs> um, I'm overheating here. <laughs> Chase, who, you wrote a book. You're an author on a book. And I'm kind of wondering what that process – by the way, do you feel like you're on my podcast right now? <laughs> kind of. Chase. <laughs> um, in a pre-interview. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's that process like? Like, is that a pain to, to do that? Or, um, mm -hmm. in your, in your opinion, what was that like? Yes, it's a pain oh, there. Answer your question. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a uh, unexpected process because, all right, it's kind of weird, but I did publish a book back in like 2011, but it wasn't a real book. It was kind of just something that I wanted to, write uh, and not pay anything to be done to it. So it was never edited. It was didn't go through any proper process. It was about a very strange topic. And it's only review. What was it about? Review, only has very negative reviews. Um, it's It started off as like a, a manual almost for this nonprofit I was working with. Mm -hmm. um, and then I couldn't figure out how to make it not incredibly boring as a manual. So I kind of made a fictional story about it that we we're just going to hand out to uh, people that were interested in joining the movement or, or whatever. But hmm. uh, that didn't go anywhere. So this was the first real experience trying to make a real book that people would actually buy and, and not hate, hopefully. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's always the, the hope, right? First, that right. people buy it. And second, that they won't hate it. But actually, maybe reverse those. But uh, I started writing out the outline and some of the general content that I wanted for each section. And months into it, I took on some co-authors to help out and put their perspectives too. Because I only have you know my limited view, which is very non-traditional in every aspect of education to base it off of. So when we're thinking about how to approach certain topics in learning medicine, because that's what the book's about. Uh, it's called Read This Before Medical School. So perfect for pre-meds. It uh, discusses a lot of the topics that we cover in the medical anemonist as far as evidence-based learning techniques, but also just you know self-care and a lot of other things that myself and the other co-authors thought were, were good topics to know about before medical school and are never brought up in undergrad. They're never even brought up in medical school for the most part. So we thought some of this material would be great to get out there and dozens, hundreds of links in the book. So the audience can feel free to investigate those topics a little more if they want to. We're not the experts on anything that we discuss there. But then the process of actually writing it and getting it published and all that is, um, it's quite a headache, <laughs> to say the least. The editing process never ends first off. Just know that going in, if you're writing a book, you're going to constantly make revisions. We had it read by I think five different physicians and med students before the first edition, and we still missed like dozens of different editorial issues there. Uh, you have to 
put it to different publishers. Obviously, Amazon is a big one, but there's a couple others. They all have a different process for sending it in. They have these auto filters, too, that will kick it out without really a good explanation of what's wrong with it or how to fix it. There's submitting to the Library of Congress and getting your, um, your barcode on the back. Uh, there's just a lot that goes into it. And then you start receiving negative reviews and you're like, oh, all of that time and energy wasted. <laughs> sounds sounds frustrating and long, but I'm sure there's some rewarding aspects to it. There have been quite a few good comments. Uh, I wish more people would leave those on Amazon because I seem to get them in like Facebook or through email or something like that. I'm like, no, no, no go to Amazon. I need it Copy there. <laughs> yeah, I need people to see that you like it there. That's more helpful to you know tell other students that you like the book and that it's good for them to buy. But um, at least it has helped quite a few people uh, that have reached out. So I'm happy about that part. Yeah. Okay. Real question here from Anne. What are some strategies to really internalize and learn what you hear on a podcast? Um, and I think I'll just mention one thing off the top, which is a lot of people might not know this, but our show notes are very detailed. So at least with the last, how many podcasts, maybe four or five now, they're very detailed show notes and we've been having somebody do that. So one way is to just follow the show notes. Um, you could also take notes yourself. But of course, the nice thing about podcasts is you're doing other things while you're listening. So um, I don't know. Another thing might be just to write down what you felt you learned in, in one or two sentences after you listen to it. Rakita, what do you think? I think everybody has their own learning style and they're all different. So Obviously, if you're listening to podcasts, some of your learning style may be audio. Um, but if you if you need to take notes, like you said, take notes. If you want to apply certain things, like if you're studying for the MCAT and you're writing in your MCAT book or something, put it in that section. Or if you're thinking of a topic from the one minute preceptor or something like that, kind of correlate it. And then for my podcast is not necessarily like hopefully you're getting some education out of it but it's more like conversational things about certain topics and it doesn't necessarily get into the educational aspect of medicine um so you could definitely take notes when someone is talking about things about like the admission process or interviews or something like that but i think it all kind of depends on your style and then of course different modalities are key so if you, you're learning and you're hearing something and you're writing it and maybe you watch it later in a another form, it might make it stick better, at least personally for me. This is a question that we've gotten quite a few times on the medical anemonist in the past. So I'm glad to, uh, to share some of the insights that we've gathered through past episodes. And I think the key to this question is when you're listening to a podcast, it is a uh, passive learning style. Uh, we like to differentiate passive learning. So podcasts, uh, someone standing up and lecturing to you, even watching pre-recorded videos are all passive learning. You don't have to necessarily interact with it. You don't have to be active when you're <clears throat> gathering that material. And that's fine for getting material very quickly. And I'm sure you understand if you're listening to a lot of podcasts in a day or even have it playing at faster playback speeds or you know a video recorded lecture, you get a lot of information thrown at you at once. Are you going to learn that? Are you going to retain it for a long period of time? And that's where the active learning strategies come in. So a lot of them that we mention in the show are obviously flashcards with space repetition or visual mnemonics, again, still using space repetition because when you're using these, you have to interact with the learning modality. You have to either answer the flashcards or you have to think up the visual mnemonics that you created before. Whatever you're associating the knowledge to, um, you have to be active with utilizing that, uh, that medium over and over and over again. So if you are listening to a lot of podcasts and maybe not retaining the material later on, first, do you want to retain that material later on? Or is it just kind of interesting to listen to now and not important for the long term? If you think it's important for the long term, you're going to want to um, implement some sort of active learning strategy. So you can create, uh, obviously, if you're driving around or something, you can't create a flashcard. But if you learn some of the medical mnemonics techniques, you could create little images and you could then place those images in a memory palace. And if all of these terms are 
new to you, then uh, you definitely need to go listen to the show. But that's one way where you can be more active with the learning initially for what's normally a very passive learning strategy. And uh, by repetition over time, by space repetition, spacing out a little bit longer every repetition, you can make sure to, uh, to really know that material and memorize it for the long term. Cool. There's a, a question for Arkita. Do you see it? And and with the fire questions, this is a good question here. How do you balance your role as a doctor uh, while also exploring other passions like podcasting and mentoring? And you are on a roll. That's an awesome question. I think it's all about what you value and what you put forth. Like, of course, you have to be organized and figure out how to do time management because you have to work and have a day job. <laughs> but when you find something that you're passionate about, you make time and you may not, you'll have to kind of figure out a different schedule. So like for my podcasting, a lot of times I'll podcast after work or if I have a break or something like that, they, they typically, if you're pre-setting what you want to ask someone and then you set up the certain time limit of how to do it, and you record, it's, it's not that time consuming. And then mentoring is more of a, a longitudinal thing where you may have an event where you go and you you talk or, or you give someone else. But like in the longitudinal people where you have the one to one mentorship with, you can check on them every few weeks or just have them text you if they have a question or a phone call once a month. So it, it just depends on what your task is and if you want to make time for it. Gotcha. Um, there's another good question here, and this is something I'm curious about too. So, uh, Karis asks, you know, how uh, is it possible to balance research in medical school? If so, kind of how does that work? And I don't know if you either of you have done research in medical school um, and could speak to this, but you know, I'm applying too, and that's something that I am really interested in doing is doing research while I'm a student. Is that something that's possible? Um, I've obviously heard of students doing that, but uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know. Is it Chase or Kita? My experiences personally are limited on this. We did have research that we did in, uh, I think our second year. Why do you put in it, air quotes? <laughs> what is, what when, you're on, when you're on a small island with very few resources, your actual research is uh, not at the highest level, we'll say. <laughs> That makes but sense. It, you just don't have all the all the resources that a, a normal medical school may have. Exactly. And it takes weeks to get anything shipped to you. And it's very expensive to ship things to a, a small island in the Korean too. But uh, it's definitely a topic that gets brought up by a lot of students, especially IMGs, because they need extra credentials for their CV quite frequently. And a lot of times they'll find outside research because some schools do have good research opportunities inside. You'll have to do research on finding out which schools those are because I do not know. Um, but if your school isn't one of those, then there can be opportunities outside of the school to, to do some research. Um, finding time to do that while going to medical school, if it's not associated with your schoolwork, is gonna be very difficult. Um, some students will take time off, such as before or after step one, or even after step two, but before graduating or something along those lines. Uh, there's a lot of variability in it. So unfortunately, there's not like a solid answer. It is possible. It's going to take a lot of networking, a lot of research to find this. It's going to work for you. I agree with Chase. I didn't personally do research, but I do have people who know people who did. A lot of people who incorporated it into their medical school studies did it via like MD PhD, where they had to do combat like dedicated years for their PhD separate from their medical education. Um, or if you had some kind of longitudinal project, like say you wanted to be a neurologist and you did some ongoing neurology work, it wouldn't be as um, in depth as because you probably wouldn't have as much time for it if you didn't take some separate time to do it. Uh, if you do have an idea, a general idea of the top couple schools you might go to, you can definitely hop on LinkedIn or hop on the school's website and see what research they might be doing. Reach out, reach out to some of the physicians and researchers there and see if they accept first year medical students. Some might not, they might want you to know more or 
you know, otherwise have certain restrictions on who they're going to allow into their research. So it's going to take some time. I'm not aware of a single resource out there for this information. And it, and it looks like she's applying to medical school right now. So, you know, that's something you might have to get there and just kind of see how that goes, how hard it is, how much free time you have. But, um, okay, let's see. Sutra asks, how many years does it take to become a cardiologist and what is the process? Um, so I, I would assume that starting from undergrad, that's four years, then medical school, four years, it's probably a four year residency. I don't know. Yeah, I think it varies. So it's it's a it's four years of college, four years of med school, and then you, for cardiology, you have to do an internal medicine residency, and then so that's three years. If you do a chief year of cardiology of uh, what do you call it internal medicine which a lot of people do to help with their applications and leadership and stuff for fellowship what is that? chief year yes yeah, so extra year of uh hmm. where you're like the chief of the residence and there's usually a group of like two or three and you're you're the highest level of resident and you manage and help with all of the residents in the program so a lot of people will use chief year as it's kind of like a pseudo attending which um is a person who's graduated from residency and they get leadership. They plan the schedules. They take the extra call. They lead the teams and stuff when they're doing rounds and, and they're kind of like the managers. Um, so a lot of people choose to do a chief year, which can boost your up your resume where then you apply to cardiology fellowship. And then there are different kinds, like there's the general cardiology fellowship and then there are, different subspecialties within that. So like, for instance, one of my friends, he did it more of a non-traditional route where he did internal medicine residency and then he decided to do research in cardiology on different things. And he did a echo fellowship where they learn how to do ultrasounds of the heart. So he did that for about two years and then applied to cardiology. So now he's a first year cardiology res fellow Whereas my other friend did it more traditional and he did the th the four years of med school, three years of internal medicine, one year of chief, and now he's a fellow. So they just have different wow. degrees, but it's a long time, <laughs> needless yeah, to say. A long time. I didn't know that. I kind of learned, learned some stuff there. Huh. Um, interesting. A lot of the specialties, you have to do a lot of them. You have to go through internal medicine first. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, all right. We want to answer any more. Let's do, uh, there's one that I saw. We'll talk about our future podcasts at the end, um, which is close. Let's see. Would having, would having English on your major look bad on your med school app? I hesitate to answer these questions because like, I don't, I don't you know, I'm not, I haven't. It's not our specialty. Yeah. It's not our specialty, but my understanding of it is, honestly, I don't have that much understanding. <laughs> I was going to say something, but I better not. I better not because I just don't know. <laughs> well, you're going to yeah. be there soon enough. So, um, no, as long as you have the prerequisites, honestly, a lot of people do major in the sciences, but majoring in something different kind of adds a unique aspect to your application. So a lot of people are like, oh, they studied English, like why? And, and it can help with certain things like your personal statement and, and just the, the other classes that you've taken in college, like the humanities and all of those things that may add a different perception to like who you are and how you got there. So I think it's an asset. Maybe you can do something unique, like uh, help be a volunteer editor for a medical textbook or something, and then it'll still be medically relevant. That's a good idea. True. All right. So just kind of to end it here, let's go around and just kind of say what your pot, what your next podcast is and some of the interest things you're interested in uh, going forward. Oh go boy. ahead, Chase. What's the schedule look like? <laughs> I got to pull it up because I don't know what order things are going in right now. So you say okay, what, what I, I can go first. Then. Yeah, I'll go All first. Right. Then. So my next episode is going to be on protein and fat metabolism. You know, I've I've covered 
carbohydrate metabolism, but I haven't covered those. So I'm doing that. And then going forward, I'm actually working on a full length MCAT audio course. So that's something to be looking out for in the next, it's going to be, it's going to take a while. So odds are, if you're studying for the MCAT right now, you, that won't be available, you know, till after you've taken it, but it, it'll be interesting. It'll be fun. Um, so if you're listening to this and it was recorded a year ago, look, go, go try to find the uh, MCAT full length audio course. Who should go next? Go ahead, Chase. I guess I'll oh, Urquita. Yeah, go, Urquita. I stole it from Chase, so I'll just read my little list. So I think next week we're going to – today I had an episode that came out, and we talked about, like, leadership and organizational management in uh, medicine and coaching um, with Dr. Ludmer, who is the curriculum dean of medical education. So listen to that if you haven't yet. Next week, we'll have Dr. Darko, who, who's a pre-med advisor, talking about application optimization during these times. I think we saw a question on there asking, like, if the application status will be different um, given COVID, and it will. Um, so she gives us a couple tips on that. And then we'll have Dr. Moseson, who's a pulmonary and critical care doc, who's living on the West Coast with all of the fires going on, who talks about climate change and advocacy and pulmonary medicine. Um, today we had a, I interviewed someone who will be on in a couple of weeks. Who's a host of the short coat podcast. It was really good. Shout out, shout out yeah. short coat podcast. I'm a big fan. If no one's ever seen the short coat podcast, go listen to it. Um, the guy who runs it, his name's Dave Etler. And it's just, yeah. he, he, he talks to a lot of the medical students at Iowa and it's, it's pretty entertaining. Actually it's pretty funny. He's awesome. As you can tell, Sam found him for me. But yeah. I love the conversation yeah. that we had. And then our last two, we'll have Dr. Jones talking about um, who's a adolescent medicine and family medicine doctor talking about advocacy in medicine, voting, and then how to, um, I saw someone asked about like the social determinants of health and how we can implement that into care. We kind of hit on that on this episode. And then there'll be more talking about like pathology and COVID and with the pathologist that lives in Florida in the coming weeks. So that'll be really exciting. That sounds awesome. Uh, we have a lot more questions there, but we might have to come back to them on a future uh, meet and greet. We can answer them if we want. Why not? Uh, I got to go at nine. That's it. Though. We still got an hour. <laughs> Keep well, coming. Then. And you can list certain uh, topics that you want us to cover too, just even if we don't get to them. Yeah. All right. I'll just quickly go over the next few episodes. I got to look at the schedule because I'm always recording and juggling two different shows. So can't really keep track of what's going on. Uh, looks like the Medical Anemonous podcast. The next one is with Rhett Thompson, which is one of the uh, co-founders for Physio. If you are pre-med and have not heard of this yet, you almost certainly will when you go into medical school. Physio helps to really clarify one of the most difficult topics, which is physiology. They have great video lectures and they also use visual mnemonics in some of their material. So that's kind of how we connected. Uh, even though I've known Rhett for a long time, we finally got him on the show. So that's going to be an interesting one. The one minute preceptor we're covering. Well, there's only a few more episodes left in this season because I kind of do it seasonally. So I get a break in between. It's too difficult to have weekly podcasts for two different ones or weekly interviews. Um, that's going to be covering Brenda Thompson does some really interesting topics on like how to get inside the mind of a residency director and kind of what they're thinking about now in the terms of COVID and medicine and step one going to pass fail and some of those topics. So for those already in medical school, it's definitely an interesting conversation. Uh, Dr. Dana Coriel is going to discuss social media for med students because so many physicians even ask this, let alone students, like, where do I draw the line? And there's definitely a lot of mistakes that you can make as a med student that could impact you later on. But that doesn't mean you have to fear using social media as long as you use it responsibly. So those are some of the ones that are coming up pretty soon. Awesome. Okay, so last thing I'm going to do here is just rapid fire questions. So I'll, I'll, ask, e I'll ask you each question. One that I saw was, does um, does doing a master's program give you a competitive advantage on the application for medical school or keto? You can weigh in on that. Um, if you know, 
I don't think so. I think we kind of covered it earlier, um, but you may not have been here where we said it, if, if you had some blemishes or things that you wanted to address or master or get better at, it could um, help you. But if you are already set with your prerequisites, you're comfortable with your MCAT score and things like that, you may just want to leap forward and try. Don't spend the extra money if you don't need it, if it's not going to help. Yep. Agreed. Um, let's see here. All right, last one. Oh, here, I'll answer this one. How can you study for the MCAT? Uh, the answer to that is a lot of hard work, really. That's what it comes down to. Um, it's, it's such a broad question. Really, what you want to do first is set a, st a study schedule, um, you know, get books, get whatever resources you find, um, listen to my podcast, maybe. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> um, just it, it comes down to a lot of hard work. And, you know, most people take between three to six months. Um, but that's probably one of the most important components of getting into um, a medical school is is the NCAT. Uh, so anyways, let's see the next question. Do, do, do. Last one here. We'll ask this to both you guys. What's your opinion from Magnus? What's your opinion on being a pharmacy technician as patient care hours for your application? Hmm. My, I would say you... I guess it depends upon what your patient care, what, what those interactions look like. Cause you know, when, when you're applying to medical school, you want to be able to write about experience you, experiences you've had that have made you want to go into medicine. So if that's an experience where you're interacting with patients and you know, it's, it's a good experience and you can write about it, then why not? And you, you feel like you're doing good, but that's, that's my opinion. I agree with Sam and I, I actually have a mentee that I talked to this week who is a pharmacist who's trying to turn change over transition into medicine. And we had a very thorough discussion on this. But my my standpoint on this is as long as you can discuss eloquently exactly why you have an interest in medicine and it should be something more meaningful than I want to help people then you have a reason why you don't have your, you could work at Starbucks and want to be a doctor. And we wouldn't say, oh my God, he worked at Starbucks. He can't be a doctor. Like your past experiences don't represent your future. So it's great that you have had some exposure to healthcare being a pharmacy tech. I think that's amazing. Like you've been able to look at some medicines and discuss ailments and stuff like that. So that may help a little bit, but I, I think as long as you can express why you wanna be a doctor, that's all you need. Yeah, definitely agree with both of those statements and also tell a story. Don't just give the facts. You want to explain and make it interesting enough that the person reading your application is going to visualize how you came across this. What was your patient interaction? How did this affect you emotionally? And if you make them feel like they're a part of that story, like they know where you're coming from, you're going to do a lot better no matter where you come from as far as your previous occupations. Yeah. And I'll end it with this. Um, if, if you take anything away from this, this discussion in your pre-med, let it be what Chase just said, that your application needs to tell a narrative. I think that's advice I got, and that's hugely important, is you know your whole application all together needs, uh, needs to tell a story. And, and I don't, you know, only you know your own story, but um, so that's, that's a great takeaway. So thanks for that, Chase. Um, all right, so with that said, you can go to perspectivedoctor.com for a lot of these different resources, the questions you may have. We have blog articles, tools, webinars, um, and of course, all of our podcasts. So thanks make again sure for coming. Make sure to subscribe. Yeah, and make sure to subscribe. Um, so thanks everybody for coming, and uh, we'll probably do this again at some point. Thanks, guys. This is fun. It was. I'm going to go take some aspirin now. I'm getting hot again. <laughs> Drink some water, get lots of sleep. <laughs> we hope you heal 